Okay, this is Dr. Morton um, recording. Uh, this is the lecture for uh, Tuesday, the 6th of October. Um, let's take a quick look at the syllabus. So, and let's see, I think I'm going to shrink myself down too in the process here. Yeah. So, on uh, October 6th down here, well, actually, sorry, I guess it's the 5th. Let's see, is this the right thing? Uh, oh, so I'm confused here. Nope, wrong one, sorry. Uh, hang on. There we go. Yeah, so uh, so I'll talk a little bit today about the project. Um, I, I'll talk more about that probably on Thursday. I want to cover touch sensing today. And uh, I'm not, I'll am not. i mention a little bit about the UART and about the... Uh, uh, the digital to analog converter uh, and I probably am not going to demonstrate the A to D converter so some of this I may do on Thursday we'll see um, <clears throat> okay and then uh, yeah and then I guess on Thursday uh, we have the uh, we have the written part of the test yeah, I need to review that. I, I think I'm going to have to change the schedule. So I will, I'll will i send out an email, but probably what I'll do is switch the written to next week. Uh, and I'll, I'll probably put it on probably something like the 13th. We'll, we'll see how that flies. Okay, yeah, I need to, I need to make some changes to that. Okay. Um, all right, so let me, uh, and we'll do this too. Okay. All right, oops. All right, so capacitive touch sensing. So, um, so I do want to uh, I do want to cover this because you're going to do this in the lab on Thursday. So this is kind of a big deal to get this covered. Okay, so uh, capacitive touch sensing is used extensively. I mean, if you take out your cell phone, uh, I'm sure you've got a touch screen on it. Um, a lot of monitors nowadays have touch screens. Uh, and then many, many, many products, uh, my refrigerator included. Uh, in fact, we have two refrigerators in the house, and both of them have touch screens. Uh, one of them's got a pretty good touch screen, and the other one's got a terrible touch screen. Uh, and it really serves to illustrate that touch screens can be done well, and they can be done poorly. Um, like almost any human interface, it's always a little bit tricky. So... So we're gonna we'll talk a little bit about some of those principles today. On your Viva board, uh, if you uh, if you look at your board, um, when we set it down here, let's see. Uh, I think I've got this laid out here pretty well. Um, let's see if we can switch this. Let me just do this real quick. We'll blow this up and we will uh, change the camera. So you can see the Viva board here, and we can blow it up a little bit, and and what you see is you have the letters UTSA up here. Now maybe some of you thought those were just for um, decoration purposes, but they're not. Uh, these are actually touch pads, and they're in the shape of these letters. Underneath the uh, the solder screen and underneath the white lettering, there is uh, copper that's connected to four different pins on your chip. And all four of those pins have the ability to be uh, capacitive touch sensing inputs. And so you can set these these four letters up as touch sensing buttons. So that's pretty cool and that should actually be kind of fun. All right, so I'm going to switch this back now and Okay, now um, these are capacitive touch sensing buttons, and it's kind of a curi curiosity a little bit. Uh, it turns out that these that that this chip has, um, even though it's not that old, it's maybe only I don't know, maybe ten years old, but this chip uh, is already a legacy chip in in that its touch sensing module is uh, is. Uh, has been uh, completely abandoned by microchip. 
Uh, I guess I still make these chips, so I guess they're still making it in that sense, but, but no new chips will have this touch sensing module in it. Um, the new chips, uh, new, new chips that incorporate touch sensing are using um, a, uh, a concept. Let's see, I, I believe I have a pretty good, uh, did I do, did I kill that? Oh, maybe I did. Oh, I think I did. Shucks, I shouldn't have done that. Um, well, crud. Let's see if it's in here. I don't even know. Um, no, let's see. Uh, no. All right. Well, all right. So let's let's do touch. Uh, I'm sorry, I wish I should, I should have kept this handy. This is probably not a good idea. I'm going to use Google. Google is still better. Okay. So if we go to the, uh, the capacity touch sensing, what, what they're using now is this thing called charge time measurement unit. And um, basically, Rather than have a dedicated uh, uh, rather than have a dedicated uh, module like we do on our chip, they use the uh, the computational analog to digital converter for touch sensing. Uh, now they still use capacitive touch sensing, but they use it in an entirely different way. They use it in a way to uh, uh, where they uh, where they compare the charge times and it's a lot more sophisticated approach and what they've done they've they've written the routines in assembly language uh, they pretty much have them available for the the PIC 18 and the PIC 24 and I guess they have uh, the code available for the PIC 16 as well although I have yet to actually implement it uh, I have not been successful implementing it on our chip um, but uh, in theory, there are PIC 16s with computing analog to digital converters that should be able to be used. So that's one of the things on my to-do list I haven't done yet. Um, let's see. So, um, so we're going to use this uh, built-in module that happens to be in our chip. Now, this built-in module is pretty sophisticated, but it turned out it has a fatal flaw. And uh, Microchip was getting a lot of complaints from a number of their customers on their touch sensing technology. And it turned out that there were other chip makers that had better touch sensing technology and Microchip was getting killed. And, uh, and so they were losing customers, people were going to other chips and Microchip had had it. And so I, I, don't, I, I don't have all the details. I, I actually talked to the experts at the master's conference a couple of years ago about this. And they, they gave me most of, they gave me some of the, they gave me the big picture, but not all the details. But I think they bought uh, a touch sensing company uh, and, then, and then realized that their touch sensing module was, was crap and they just abandoned it completely and uh, came up with this whole new approach. Now that's, that's my understanding. And the whole new approach uh, is actually pretty extensive. Sorry, I got a cell phone out of my pocket. Because it includes um, it includes gestures and a bunch of other things, and so for those of you who don't know, so touch sensing now has gotten very complicated uh, because you can uh, build these sensors in such a way that you don't have to actually touch them; you can just gesture above them, and uh, and so they have software that will recognize gestures, they have software that will recognize touches, and you can do touch sliders and uh, you can do circular touches. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff you can do. And uh, so because of this, uh, touch sensing has gotten kind of crazy. Uh, but in the end, it, the capacity of touch sensing that makes up most, a lot of the touch sensing. Now the, the screen on your smartphone is not a capacity touch sensing screen. It's uh, at least most of them are inductive, I think. Uh, 
when uh, in micro two, we uh, balance a steel ball on a little tilt table and we use a touch screen on top of that to tell us where the ball is so we know how to adjust the touch table uh, using servos on both axes. That, that touch screen is a resistive touch screen. So that's a whole different technology. Uh, but what, what, what we're going to use in this class, we're going to use the capacity touch sensing module. And uh, even though it's sort of outdated now because microchips kind of gone a totally different direction, they still use capacity touch sensing, but they're using a, a slightly different approach. Uh, nonetheless, this, this is very, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's, uh, it, it's, there's nothing wrong with learning about this module because the, the technology is very similar to what's being done. It's just that they're using a slightly different way to do it that avoids some of the inherent problems of this particular module. So it's not a, a waste of your time. Um, and, it, and it is quite interesting. And then if you wind up using one of these other modules, then great, fine, you can just make that transition. Um, okay. Um, so the way this module works, and uh, let me let me pull up the data sheet. I, I probably should have done that. Uh, let me. I'm going to pause this a minute and get the data sheet up. Okay, so here's the data sheet, and uh, if we go over here to the uh, table of contents, you can scroll down and you can see down here. Let's see where is it. Uh, Uh, where is it? Oh, 27, Capacity Touch Sensing Module. So you click on that, and this takes us down here. Now here's the block diagram, uh, and we'll go through this in a minute. It it uses uh, the same channels that the A to D converter uses. So, they, so if you're using 12 channels of A to D conversion, you won't have any touch sensing uh, opportunities. Um, this analog multiplexer selects that, selects that channel, and then it, it brings it into this capacitive sensing oscillator. Now this capacitive sensing oscillator is, is a little bit similar to the A to D converter module. Um, and, but what happens is it uses this external connection as, as a capacitor in this, uh, in this uh, uh, RC oscillator. And it's got a couple things you can, contr you can control for here that you can set up uh, with these uh, control signals. You can set up the fixed voltage reference and you can set up the digital analog uh, conversion output. So you so it allows you to set some different voltage levels here. Uh, but what happens is uh, all this goes into this oscillator and this oscillator will oscillate at a frequency determined by how by this external capacitor and then obviously to some degree, these internal uh, settings and internal uh, parasitic capacitance. When you touch the touch sensing pad, you increase the capacitance and you decrease the frequency that this oscillator is oscillating at. Now, this oscillator sends out a little signal. Uh, it's it's a, not a pure square wave. It's more like a sawtooth wave. And it goes into, uh, well, you can choose. You can send it to the timer zero module or you can send it to the timer one module. Uh, I, we've just routinely used timer one, and then uh, and there's a reason for that. But we use but we but you have to use two separate modules to make this work. Uh, the reason you have to do two separate modules is this: you're actually you're actually measuring the frequency of this oscillator, and to do that, you count when when the when it's sending out a signal, you count how many pulses this signal gives you in a fixed amount of time. Now, we, we only sense it for maybe, uh, uh, you know, maybe a few milliseconds. But, but let's, say you say, let's say you sense it for a whole second, which would be r ridiculous, but let's just say for sake of, sake of thinking about this, you sense it for a whole second, and during that second, you count how many pulses of this output you see in this timer one counter. Now, timer one counter is a six is a sixteen bit counter, so you can count up to sixty five thousand. So you could so you could measure a frequency of sixty five thousand uh, by counting sixty five thousand pulses in that one one second interval. Now, uh, 
Obviously, if you only count it for half a second and you count it 65,000 pulses, you'd have to double it to get the actual frequency. Now, we don't really care what the actual frequency is per se, but what we're actually looking for is we want to sense a touch. And so the way we sense that touch is we, we establish, uh, we, we f try and figure out, okay, what's the frequency uh, when, uh, or, or better yet, what, we're, gonna, we're just going to measure how many counts in an arbitrary period of time. Let's say 10 milliseconds or maybe something like that. So, so in 10 milliseconds, how many counts will we get? And, and then if, when nothing's touched, we measure how many counts we get. And then we measure how many counts we get when it's touched. And we'd like that to be, we'd like to use up a good, good part of our, of our 16 bits so we, so we have more sensitivity. Uh, so we want the count to be, you know, uh, we don't want it to be maxed out at F, F, at F, 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 F when we're, uh, when we're just, uh, when we're counting without a touch, but we'd like it to be maybe, you know, over A000, for instance. We'd like it to be, you know, over maybe 30,000 anyway. Uh, and then when we touch it, we'd like it to go down uh, enough so that we can pick a threshold about halfway between the maximum count when it's not touched and the minimum count when it's touched really good and, uh, and set that threshold maybe halfway in between so that, uh, so that we have a pretty ro robust threshold for detecting when we've touched it. Okay, so, uh, so let me go back to the slides. I think they might be better. Um, so let me do this real quick. Okay, so, so we, we have this tune circuit, and the tune circuit is connected to our touch pads, our U, well, it's connected to one of the pads through this analog multiplexer. And when it's connected to, say, the U, if you don't touch the U, then this tune circuit will be oscillating at a fairly high frequency. And when you do touch it, it'll lower that frequency. And if we've set our threshold right, then we'll say, okay, somebody is touching the U pad. And uh, same thing for the T, the S, and the A pads. Uh, now, it turns out that for most purposes, uh, these, uh, these four pads have all been able to use pretty much the same uh, the same threshold uh, and, it, and it works okay but you could fine-tune the threshold for each pad but we've pretty much used the threshold uh, the same threshold for each pad and it, and it seems to work just fine now the the confusing part of this is that you have to have two timers and the reason you have to have two timers is that one timer has to give you this fixed time base of so many milliseconds. And during this so many millisecond time base, let's say it's 10. So every single time you collect, you collect pulses from your oscillator for 10 milliseconds. And you can't, that can't be approximately 10 milliseconds. It's gotta be very close to exact. It's gotta be really tight. And so, it turns out that timer zero uh, is able to do, when it overflows, it's able to, to stop timer one's counting by using the timer one gate. And so what we do is then we let timer zero, we start it and we, uh, we zero out timer one, we start timer zero, we let timer one start counting pulses from the capacity touch sensing module. And then when timer zero overflows, we look and see how many counts we have in timer one because it automatically gets stopped by the, by the, by the overflowing of timer zero using the gate control. Well, when we read timer one, it's either got more counts than the threshold we set or fewer counts than the threshold we set. If it's got fewer counts, then we know that our frequency has dropped and we, we assume then that it's been touched. If on the other hand it's above the threshold, we assume that it wasn't touched or it was, wasn't touched enough to trigger a touch. And so we, we consider it not touched. And now that works great for one pad, but what if we wanna, what if we wanna be checking on all four pads all the time? Well, we only have one of these modules, so what we have to do is we have to multiplex it. We have to first connect to, to the U in UTSA and 
measure how many counts we get there. Then we have to sh re then we have to connect our, our oscillator to the T, count how many counts we get there. Then we have to count it to the S, count how many counts we get there. And finally to the A, count how many counts we get there. And then we go back to the U and we keep doing that. And we do that very quickly. Maybe we do that, uh, maybe we count oh, through all four of those different pads. Maybe we do that uh, 100 times in a second. So if we do that 100 times in a second, then we can tell if any of the pads are touched. And if one of them's touched, we'll, we'll, we'll know that because the counts will drop below what we expect when they're not touched to a lower number. Now, some of the pads nearby may change a little bit, but if you're not touching that specific pad and you set the threshold appropriately, you shouldn't get a false, uh, a false reading of a touch. Uh, now, if your threshold set poorly, then you may not detect a touch that is a real touch, or you may detect uh, something that's not a touch. So you, you do need to play with the threshold a little bit and get it so it's working well. And you want that threshold set just right. And again, if you want to be a purist, you could, you could create a little array and store a threshold for each different uh, sensor, for each different pad. And then you could change the threshold on the fly too. But uh, just to simplify the code, we're not going to do that. Although if you want to code that up, you're welcome to do it. Um, now, one of the problems is, we, in order to do this, we have to see what the numbers are in the pad, what, what the frequency, you know, what, what sort of count it's getting when it's not touched, and then we have to see what kind of count it's getting when it's touched. Now, uh, we could use our debug capability in our IDE to do that, and, uh, and we, 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 that's how we used to do this lab. Uh, we, we just used the debug features. But it actually is nicer if you don't use the debug features because uh, you can, you can, if you can have a running output of the count, it's really nicer. And, that, and so what we do instead, we're going to use the, uh, the UART, which stands for Universal Synchronous Asynchronous Transceive Re uh, tra Receive Transmit. Uh, and because we're using that, we're going we're, we're to have to plug in a, uh, a US, uh, a TTL level UART, uh, and TTL level just means it's zero, it's, uh, it goes from zero volts to 3.3 or zero volts to five, whatever we're running the chip at, as opposed to uh, the old standard RS-232 levels of plus or minus 15 volts. So we're not using those higher levels, we're using TTL levels. And we're gonna convert those TTL level UART outputs directly into a USB signal that we can then plug into our desktop or laptop. And how are we gonna do that? Well, we're gonna use the CR2102 little dongle. All right, so let me go back to that. Uh, I'm gonna do this again. And, uh, shucks. And I'll switch the cameras uh, here and I'll get one of those dongles and plug it in. Now here's the dongle. I'm gonna unplug it for a minute. So this is what the dongle looks like, okay? And this chip it has on here, that's the CR2102 chip. And if you notice, this dongle has some pins on it. Now, if yours soldered on like this, where it sticks straight down, then it's going to be, you just kind of put it on top of this where it's laid out. Notice it says 3.3, and then DTR, MCU TX, MCU RX, ground, and 5 volts. And if you look at this, it says exactly the same thing. 3.3 DTR, receive, transmit, ground, and 5 volts. So you want those plugged in exactly correctly. If you plug them in wrong, you'll burn this out. And uh, they cost a couple of bucks, so I'd appreciate you not burning them out. Um, so now if, if you got yours on eBay, you can keep it. But if you checked it out, I'd like you to give it back to me. Um, if you want to buy one, you can give me a couple bucks. Uh, then that's fine. And the cord's a couple bucks too, but whatever. But anyway, uh, so, and you'll also notice if you turn your switch off, your board continues to run, and that's because it can be powered from your dongle. Uh, so that's kind of a nice feature, and it can actually, it, it, it has a 3.3 volt, and it has a 5 volt uh, output, so it can theoretically be powered either way. Uh, and you, you can just move this jumper, uh, and you can move the jumper and switch it from whatever power to the other power. 
now the the three point the five volts is very good the 3.3 is not very good it's not particularly accurate it's probably four and a half volts so you know if you really want it 3.3 then you have to plug it you have to power it through through your voltage regulators here and you select which 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 source of power you're getting with this jumper switch up here and that's why this jumper switch is not really an off switch all it does is select between your power input or your CR2102 input and it switches both the 5 volts and the 3.3 volts so that's that's how that is it so it's a little more complicated than it looks uh, okay now so if you have one that has the right angle headers then you'll have to plug it in you have to plug it in like this and you want to plug it in facing this way because you want those pins to match don't plug it in facing this way that if you look at it that won't work because the 5 volts will be where the 3.3 is and it will it you know it, it does it does uh, I have blown them doing that so they don't work when you plug them in that way they, they it doesn't hurt your Viva board but it does does tear up your your dongle okay so anyway so so what we're going to do with this we're going to use the pot to set the threshold and and I think that's what we're going to do anyway uh, and we're going to use the uh, the CR2102 to display that threshold uh, on our screen so we can see what the threshold is and and that's kind of cool uh, so and I'll talk a little bit more about this lab later on uh, on, on Friday on Thursday I'll actually demo it so you know exactly what you're going to do on Friday okay let me switch this back okay all right now um, okay so uh, so what are the so let's talk about the pros and cons for touch sensing I, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the specifics uh, and maybe when I demo it, I'll show you a little bit more. But what I want you to—I I, I want you to think about the benefits, and the benefits are huge. First off, uh, it's much cheaper than mechanical buttons. Believe it or not, um, just the switch on your Viva board—you uh, know—I had to shop really aggressively to get them. Uh, For—I don't know—I think I was—I think I paid maybe 15 cents a piece or 10 cents a piece. But if you buy them from Mauser, you know they want maybe thirty-five cents a piece, more than a quarter a piece for them, and and that's not too fancy of a switch. If you get a little bit fancier switch, you can pay a buck for a switch or more. If you get a really robust switch, like something you might install, um, you know, uh, like on a video game uh, console or something, where it's going to take a lot of wear and tear and abuse, uh, you're gonna you're gonna spend some serious bucks on that. Uh, mechanical switches have moving parts and moving parts break uh, contacts get dirty and stop working and uh, cause all sorts of problems um, but your touchpad it, it's those those uh, four touch pads on this Viva board they didn't cost us a thing if we took those off the price of that printed circuit board would be exactly the same not a penny more, not a penny less. So they're basically free. Uh, now, if you build a device and you have to have a, an extra little panel with the touch pads on it, and then you have to cover it and, and you know fancy it up, that's that's going to cost you a little bit. Obviously, it's not going to be free, but it's nowhere near the going to be the cost of a mechanical switch. And especially if you already have your printed circuit board done, and you can use part of that for your touch buttons. Then you can get it almost free. The fact that it, these touch buttons don't have any moving parts except for your human finger, uh, there's nothing for them. There's nothing really to break. Oh, I guess you can get, uh, you know, you could get an electrostatic discharge uh, or something that would cause uh, damage to the CPU. But basically, uh, we normally cover these up with a nice layer of insulation so that you're unlikely to uh, to be able to to sh you know get a good uh, static electricity discharge into the into those uh, touch pads so the other thing that's really nice is uh, 
you can't use a switch in a wet environment because it'll corrode super fast and be worthless, or it'll just flat short out. Uh, but touch pads, you can you can seal them up and use them in wet environments even. And uh, because you're not actually touching uh, any metal, uh, you can put a piece of plexiglass over the top of them and uh, you're not touching anything. It's great. And then the other thing that's nice is you can, uh, you can have uh, an area uh, of touch and you can reconfigure it. You can have you can have the whole screen be one big touch button if you want, and then uh, you can reconfigure it and have 30 touch buttons on the same screen if you're using a you know a, uh, if you're using a say a touchpad for a screen. In in our case, we're not you know we're not we're not implementing something quite that complicated, but even in our case, you can do some uh, reconfiguration. Um, you do have to have a processor though. You've got to have a micro to make these work. Um, and sometimes a lot of people really get into the uh, to the to the tact to the tactile feedback and even the audio the audible feedback of a of the click of a switch. You know, just clicking a switch and feeling that click is a very uh, it's it's kind of satisfying. You definitely know you threw the switch, and when you hear that click, it, it really confirms that. And you don't you, you you don't have any moving parts with these touch buttons, but now a lot of times you've probably noticed you they, there will be a feedback click so you know when you when your touch has been uh, uh, recognized, and you could build that into this into your Viva board too if you want it. Uh, sometimes touch buttons can be fussy. It is possible for external interference to cause problems with them, and. Uh, they can be pretty responsive, but you know you you probably can switch a flip a switch a little faster than you can a touch button. Um, so you might consider them slightly slower. And if you have to input a lot of things, like for instance, I guarantee you most people can type faster on their 101 keyed keyboard than they can on their smartphone with their thumbs. Although I've seen some people type pretty fast, so it's close, but. But a, a real skilled typist, you know, doing 120 words a minute on her keyboard, you can't do that on a on an iPhone touch screen, or even a bigger touch screen. Um, okay, so the um, so in our 1829, we have uh, up to 12 pins that can be uh, can be touch sensitive uh, touch sensor inputs. We've only implemented four on the Viva board. Uh, if you wanted to do more, you would have to uh, have a, a touchpad set up as an, you know, as a add-on board, and then you'd have to plug it into one of the available uh, uh, pins to support touch sensing. So remember, this touch, these touchpads, the UTSA pads, are act like a small value capacitors, probably in the order of a of a few uh, uh, picofarads, and they change the time constant of this RC circuit. So, um, the other thing that's a little bit of an issue is you do have to have two, two timers to make this work because you have to count over a fixed time period. And you don't want your fixed time period to be so long that you'll, you know, that you'll um, miss um, well, that you'll overflow, that you'll count, that you'll get so many counts that you'll overflow. So you do have to kind of play around with it a little bit. And the other thing is, you want to be able to scan all four buttons rather quickly. So if you're counting for too long, that's going to slow your scan rate down. If you, you know, if you if you want to scan it, maybe let's say you want to scan it at least ten times a second, then then you can't do any more than about two and a half milliseconds per button on your scan time, uh, or, or on your on your counting time. And so there are some parameters you sort of have to monitor to make this work uh, the way you'd like to. Okay, so um, the and the timers on this board have just been naturally set up to use timer zero for the fixed base and timer one to hold the the counts th that the oscillator generates during that fixed time base. So we looked at this already, um, and again. You use both timer zero module and timer one module connected to your capacitive touch sensing oscillator to make this work. 
the timer zero module counts over a fixed interval and then when it overflows uh, it automatically uh, stops timer one and then what you do is you clear timer one or you read the value compare it to the threshold and then you change the if you want to scan another touchpad then you have to change your your uh, multiplexer settings so that you're connected to a different touchpad and then uh, once you're connected to another touchpad then you uh, then you you start timer zero again and at the same time you clear the counter register in timer one so it's starting from zero and boom when timer zero overflows again you read timer one because it automatically stopped by this gate control and uh, when you read timer one uh, then you compare at the threshold and again if it's over the threshold then you conclude no touch if it's below the threshold you conclude it was touched and then you go to the next pad all right um, and yeah this is timer one so in in this it this just shows the timer one and uh, this is where it's going to hold the count now it Timer 1's got a little multiplexer too, and one of the settings allows the signal from the capacitive touch sensing oscillator to go directly through the prescaler and into the synchronizing detector. So it's it, they're pretty well all set up to do this function with the capacitive touch sensing module, and it works pretty works pretty well. Now, what's the problem? Why did Microchip abandon this? Well, they abandoned it because if you have an it. So you, you have this set up to detect uh, a threshold at a certain frequency that the timers run at. And you, you don't even know what the frequency is because you don't really care. You're just measuring it in that fixed interval that timer one, uh, sorry, that timer zero sets up. Let's say it's five, nan five, five uh, let's say it's 50 microseconds, okay? So in that 50 microseconds, how many counts do you generate? Well, it's, it's, it, it depends if it's not touched, you, you should get a maximum number, and if it's touched, you should get a, de a lower number. And then you pick a threshold halfway in between, and, and that's how you sense a touch. Okay, that's great. Uh, but what if there's an external uh, signal that's uh, generating a frequency that's, uh, that's lower than the threshold, and your, your little counter, your little CPU picks this up as noise, and and it's generating counts in timer in timer one, and it screws up your numbers. Or maybe there's an external signal that's uh, lower lower in frequency, uh, and it and it's it's it registers that. So then you wind up concluding that uh, your your pad's been touched, even though it hasn't been because of this uh, noise. And it and it turns out these these uh, if you did this application use this if you try and use this touch sensing module. In a in a noisy environment where there are some signals just like that, it's going to cause real havoc, and it's very very difficult to work around it. And that's that was the that was the Achilles tendon that caused Microchip to abandon this technology. Now, if you don't have that noise signal, no problem, it's going to work great. Uh, and for our purposes, it works fine. But if you do have that that really bad noise you're done. You, you, this, this, this solution doesn't work very well in that environment. Okay, um, so we set timer zero up much like we did before. Uh, well, we, I guess we use timer one, but we'll use timer zero similar to where we use timer two, four, or six. Um, so uh, so when you, do, I'll go over the lab specifically on Thursday, so we'll talk through this. But the main thing you're going to have to do once you get the code set up and running, then you should see on your screen a continual running display of uh, the counts as they pop out. And that's where you have to see, okay, I touch it, my counts go down to what? I stop touching it, my counts go up to what? And now I want to split that difference and set my threshold right there and see if I can reliably detect my touch. You will see that how how firmly you push on the on the pad changes how much skin uh, surrounds that pad and and changes uh, changes how much the capacitance go, goes up, which how, which changes how much the frequency uh, or the number of counts goes down. 
because you slow the time the, the oscillator down when you increase the capacitance and you can even see that as you start to get close to the pad you will see some subtle changes and before you even touch it you you will also see uh, some decrease in the counts but it may not drop below the threshold and that's where you want to pick the threshold to be a kind of a nice number so that it works well uh, and then once you do that uh, once you see what your touched and untouched values are you should be able uh, you, you should have those all scrolled on your screen uh, because you're going to be outputting them using your UART through your dongle onto your laptop or desktop to a terminal program now all the terminal program is it's just a program that reads the input coming from from this uh, this USB input and then you can and usually it's bi-directional you can you can send information back uh, to your board uh, but we're not going to do that we're just going to look at the threshold and then we're going to I can't remember if we set the threshold with the pot or if we t type it in and then recompile the code I think maybe we type it in all right so that's kind of a quick uh, overview over ca for capacitive touch sensing. Okay, so <clears throat> so let me let me get rid of this. All right, uh, so let me just pull up the lab. Uh, well, no, I think I'll, I'll cover that on Thursday and I'll demo and, and everything, so that should be fine. Um, yeah so maybe maybe what I'll do is just give you a um, well hang on okay so uh, what I want to do now is talk a little bit about the project and um, so I, I'm not I so right now I don't have this in the syllabus um, in fact I didn't uh, I didn't specifically put anything in the syllabus about the project, um, but I, but, but let me go through and I'll tell you what I'm thinking. So, traditionally, we've we've actually had a a demo day where we set up tables in the atrium and we had everybody present their projects on the same day. And so I don't think we can do that this year, um, which is sad because it was kind of fun to be able to showcase the stuff you've done. I still want you to do a project, but. Um, in this case, we'll, you can, uh, you, so what I'll probably do, uh, I don't know. So I, I will still let you do a project of your choice. However, I'll probably make some suggestions for those who, uh, who are interested in, um, who want to do a project, but they don't, uh, you know, but they, they can't come to lab and pick up any special parts. Uh, so I'll probably say, I'll probably create maybe two or three uh, options that you can do with the existing parts, and and pretty much everybody's going to have uh, eventually the so the folks that that couldn't come in that got their parts on eBay you you already have an LCD two line by sixteen LCD display you have the CR twenty one hundred two you have the analog board you have and then you have your Viva board and the programmer so that's that so I'll do several projects. Uh, that you can do with just those with just that equipment um, I will also do uh, I'll also let somebody who wants to do other things do other do those other things so if you have some interest you're you're welcome to do it um, yeah I have uh, so uh, so let me go through some of the options you can do now uh, uh, I do want you to submit a proposal and I'll approve it. You don't have to do that yet because I haven't even come up with the, the with the generic, uh, uh, you know, with some suggestions for projects you can do with your existing hardware. But for instance, with the existing hardware, you can do a cipher lock using the touch pads. And a lot of students have done that in the past. Um, and it's kind of fun. Um, and uh, with the existing hardware, you can do... Uh, uh, you can you can have a, a nice little user interface with your uh, with your two line by sixteen display. You can even have a game where a Simon Says type game where you have to remember sequences of touch pads and then you have to reproduce them. Uh, or 
are you, we will flash the the colors that sync with the touch pads and then you can um, and then you have to punch the touch pads to reproduce those um, and there's a bunch of different things you can do because you have four touch pads you have an RGB LED you have a push button you have a two line by 16 LCD display and you have a temperature sensor you have a uh, potentiometer and a and you have a photoresistor so there's a lot of things you can do um, you can measure the temperature and display it on the uh, two line by 16 display that would actually be fine and you can also indicate it with the color of the LED um, and, and there are a lot of different things you could do so um, so I'll, I'll throw out some several possible generic ideas and then you you're welcome to, to think about them all right so uh, so one thing you do have to get all your labs done with except you can miss one lab if you miss one you'll still get points off but you you will get a grade it'll probably cost you an A though but uh, but if you are missing two labs you're gonna get an incomplete and you must make all labs up by the date that the projects do so by the 12th of November um, no pick labs should be well I think that's the 13th I think uh, I don't know about the KL25Z. Right now I'm thinking we won't do the KL25Z lab. They're certainly there available. If you want to uh, come by a Freedom Board or order one online, you're welcome to do that. Uh, th there are Freedom Boards in the uh, parts bin. And I forget what we charge, 14 or 15 bucks. I think they, they cost maybe 16 plus shipping now. Um, okay. Now the way I'll have you turn in the final projects, it'd be nice to do it on Zoom, but I'll probably just have you do a short video and and then uh, and then email me the video, uh, and then we will have a final exam. Okay. Uh, so for for projects, so uh, again, you can use just the parts you have, uh, or you can pick a peripheral to interface or configure. Now. Uh, one of the peripherals, obviously, you're going to have is a two line by 16 display controlled by the I squared C uh, connection. Uh, and you also have an analog board where you can read in a pot setting, or you can read in a temperature setting, or you can read in uh, the a measure of the uh, of the brightness on the uh, photoresistor. Uh, but there are other things you can interface as well, and I'll give you I'll give you some of those. And what I want you to do then is I want you to uh, actually uh, look at uh, the various uh, options and if some of you want to do one of these you know other things that's fine if you don't want to if you just want to do one of the kind of standard projects that's fine too but but everything but you have to submit it uh, a little video of it by the 12th of November now the video should be really short uh, I don't know I don't know what the limit is but I, I know it, it can't be much more than you know, I think it has to be under 25 megabytes. Um, okay, uh, so here are some things that can be interfaced. So obviously, the pot that's there. Uh, obviously, you can you can PWM uh, the uh, LEDs. So for instance, one of the things you could do is you could you could have every tap on the U could uh, increase the intensity of the the red RGB. Uh, every tap on the T could increase the intensity of the green uh, LED, and every tap on the S could increase the intensity of the blue LED. And so you could actually generate whatever color you want by just tapping those various pads, and then you could erase them all. You could set them all back to zero by hitting the uh, A. So, so that's something you could definitely do, and that'd be that'd be actually pretty cool. Be uh, touch sensing it would be PWM um, and it'd be a little bit of a tricky user interface so it's not bad you could also uh, let the uh, LED uh, indicate a, a rough measure of cold or hot and you could sense the room temperature or you could sense the temperature of something else using your little uh, temperature sensor on the board um, you could interface uh, um, a bunch of things now the LCD uh, everybody's going to do anyway and the temp sensor everybody's going to do but you can interface a GPS an accelerometer a compass uh, a clock package uh, a bunch of stuff and then you could also do uh, 
You can use, uh, I have an infrared remote sensor you, you could interface. I have, uh, uh, there's, uh, you can use a timer module to count pulses or something. You can use uh, a D-Day uh, output. You can use your comparator. You can use the UART. Um, you can read something besides the pot or the temperature sensor with your A to D. Uh, you could read like a ground, ground uh, moisture sensor, for instance. Uh, you can interface a real-time clock or uh, a small EE prom. Um, you can uh, you could use a PWM to drive an H bridge to drive a little motor. You could interface uh, a ping sensor. I have a whole bunch of those. Um, and you could print out the distance uh, to an object uh, using the ping sensor on your two line by 16 LCD display. Now, you can work together in your projects. You can have, your projects can either be one person, two people, or three people. But once you submit your proposal, you can't add people at the last minute to your project because that basically means they didn't do any work and you're just helping them uh, get credit with no work. So, uh, so you can always kick people off your project, but you can't add anybody. So, uh, so when you submit your proposal, you have to decide whether you're going to work by yourself or with somebody else or with two other people. No, gr no groups of four. And once you submit your proposal, that's it. You cannot add any more people to your proposal. Um, you can modify your proposal after you've submitted it, but, the, but you can't modify the people in it except to decrease them. Uh, you should, your proposal needs to give a statement of work, what you're going to do. Uh, you can only use your Viva board, that's it. You can't use an Arduino or some other, some other computer. You can't do some, uh, some project for another class and recycle it for this one. Uh, you can't buy a commercial kit and assemble it. Uh, your project has to use, if you have three people, then you have to have at least three uh, peripheral devices that you're using. That could include like a timer, PWM, and maybe uh, an A to D conversion. You, you, your project needs to include either an LCD display uh, or to use the CR2102 UART to send information to the desktop or, or back, vice versa. Or if you want to interface a o OLED display, you can do that. I have some of those. Uh, and for most things you need, I, I can give you help with those. Let's see. So. Um, you should also give an estimate of how long it's going to take you to finish. Okay, so, uh, and then you, uh, you can go ahead and get started on your project. I'll, I'll sign off on them all by November the 29th, and you certainly have to have your proposal in by then. Um, there's an online form on the Blackboard to submit and submit it online. And I'd like you to give me at least a, you know, sort of a midpoint for what you'll get done by, say, the, uh, uh, oh, not November 29th, uh, October 29th. My bad. Hang on, let me fix that. Yeah, October 29th. Okay. Uh, Why does it do that? That's the strangest thing. All right, and uh, so so we won't we won't do the actual uh, live presentations. We'll just have you make a little video, uh, and you should put your uh, uh, UTSA ID somewhere in the video. Okay, uh, and we may not have prizes this semester. We'll see. All right. Well, that pretty much covers what we need to do. I'm going to have to sign off, and uh, we will. Um, then we'll we'll finish things up um, we'll finish things up on Thursday. All right.